Kia ora. Hello. It's great to be with you today. I'm Caitlin. And I'm Jerem. And welcome to our online service. We're going to be hearing from Jenny, who's going to be leading us through our, the first of our Mission Possible series. We're going to be taking communion a little bit later. So if you've not got um, the juice and bread ready, it might be a good moment to do that now. Mm. Uh, also, if you'd like to be in touch with us through uh, your time with us now, feel free to email us online at thestreet.org.nz. Yeah, awesome. Uh, we've got some things we'd love to celebrate with you guys today. The first of which is uh, something that I'm personally super stoked about uh, looking after our city team, and that is that we have appointed a new associate children's pastor, the wonderful Emma Roach. I think we have a photo coming up for you now for those who can't put a face to a name. Emma has been a massive part of our uh, church uh, family. She's so involved. You might have seen her uh, worship leading uh, with her husband, Isaac. She's a part of our massive youth group. She's on the Mosaic Women's Leadership Team. She helps make a bunch of our services run. Emma is so gifted, and it's amazing to see her step up in this way, and it's going to be such a blessing uh, to helping disciple um, our wee ones to become total followers of Jesus. So uh, congrats, Emma. Uh, stoked to have you step up into that role. Uh, something else that we're celebrating is uh, new life. Congratulations to Josh and Narelle Lopdell with their beautiful little girl, Amelia Primrose Lopdell, a lovely little addition to that family. So congratulations to you guys. I hope you're getting some sleep. It's very important. Mm, absolutely. Some great news there. Yeah. Um, just a reminder that if you want to keep up to date with things that are going on here at the street, it's a great idea to download our Church Centre app. So that's not the app that we used to be using. And if no. you've still got that, please delete it. Definitely. Um, but search for Church Centre and you'll find the app there. Beautiful. Love it. Hey, welcome to the couch, Caitlin. Thank you. This is first time, isn't yep, it? That's right. It's great. Uh, for those of you who are eagle-eyed, you would have noticed that when it came up with Caitlin's name, it would have said Caitlin Ormiston, East and TSCF. So Caitlin's here in a dual purpose today, uh, an important part of our East uh, family, part of the East leadership team with Simon and Jenny, but also one of our commissioned missionaries mm. serving locally here in Wellington. Yeah. Um, Caitlin, you are part of TSCF. So for those who uh, are watching for the first time or have no idea what mm. I just said, uh, <laughs> who are you and what does TSCF do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I work for an organisation called TSCF, which is the Tertiary Students Christian Fellowship. You see why we call ourselves TSCF. Mm -hmm. um, and our vision is to see students reached for Christ and change for life. So we have groups across the campuses of uh, universities and polytechs all across New Zealand and our, um, our desire is to see the students that are in those groups coming to know Jesus for the first time and sharing him with those that they come across, those in their courses, uh, those that they live with um, all over the university campus. Mm. Uh, my role is the Chief Operating Officer, so I run all of the admin functions, all of the kind of back office uh, things that go on to support the the, feel, uh, the work on campuses. Cool. You're the engine room. Something like that. Yeah, the engine room. <laughs> it's good. So uh, it's such an important ministry, mm -hmm. I mean, for, for anyone, but I guess especially students, it's such a you know, tumultuous, can be a tumultuous mm -hmm. time of their lives. Over the past months, what have been some of the highlights, some, maybe some of the challenges? What, mm -hmm. What's been going on for you guys? Yeah, I mean, I think just like for everyone in this last little while, it's been a challenging time. Mm. I heard recently that in the first few weeks of the semester at the beginning of in February, about 80% of students in halls at Vic in Wellington uh, had COVID. Wow. So if you can imagine going to university for the first time ever and 80% of the people that you live with are locked down because they're ill. Mm. It's not a great way to start your university experience, right? Mm. Um, so it's been hard to build momentum this year. It's been hard for students to, to get out and meet people, never mind um, share their faith with them. Mm. Um, so it has been hard and that's been across the country. But it's also been really encouraging, particularly recently, we just had our national gathering down in Queenstown and um, it was great seeing students from all over the country come together and uh, share stories with each other, be trained and equipped together so that they can go out to, back to campuses um, with a, a love of Jesus and um, an excitement and an enthusiasm to share him. 
uh, back in the student world. Yeah, it's awesome. And what sort of fruit are you guys seeing from the, from the campus ministries? Um, it's, it's been exciting to think of a couple of things uh, recently, particularly out of Wellington. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the people that was at our conference in Queenstown recently is a guy who grew up in Wellington, um, never really explored faith while he was here, but when he went down to Lincoln University, he, um, he started meeting some Christians and, and they and convinced him to study the book of Luke with him. Right. And over the course of about two years, they studied uh, Luke together. And through that time, he said he, um, he just became struck of the, the truths of God wow. uh, through the Bible and mm. was convicted of his own need for Jesus. Wow. And so about a year ago, he uh, came to faith. And it was so fantastic seeing him back at conference this year as a believer, wow. as someone asking questions with a different um, a different focus yeah. and uh, yeah, so praise the Lord for people like him. And um, there's also a guy uh, called Josh. I don't know if anyone would know him, but he actually grew up in Miramar. Um, and again, he, uh, for, for personal reasons, that kind of took him away from church when he was growing up. And he had some really hard stuff going on. But when he went to university, again, he was really drawn to the CF and um, through that, he start, again started reading the Bible with friends and they started helping him to really see some of the difficult things that he'd been working through and God met him in that space. Wow. And the awesome thing is now, um, those who've been tracking with me for a little while would know we've been praying for staff in Auckland and this year J Josh joined the team in Auckland as our team leader. Wow. And it's so awesome seeing him step into that as someone who came to faith as a student uh, convicted so much of the need for it and going and sharing it in Auckland. So. Yeah, amazing. That's so great just to hear about those, you know, seeing tangible fruit mm -hmm. and people's lives change. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, what, can, what can we be praying for, Caitlin? Um, lots of things. Um, <laughs> it's the beginning of a new semester. And as I said at the beginning, it's, it was hard starting the year this year because clubs get, days got cancelled, students mm. were in lockdown. Mm. But actually, just now we've had like the, a do-over so universities are starting to do club days again and build connections. So it would be great to pray for groups as they start building on those connections that they would be able to uh, sow seeds and start um, thinking how to, to reach those that have come along um, and they're starting to build connections with. Um, I think it would be great to pray for the students of New Zealand. Mm. I think it's such a lonely time to mm. be a student. And particularly, if you think people who are in their third year have never known university without being in a pandemic. Yeah, that's true. That is it's just sad mm. <laughs> and, um, and hard and lonely. So pray for the students of New Zealand mm. and that God would meet them. Um, thirdly, for TSCF, it would be great to pr pray for us in our recruitment We've had some hard things in Wellington, especially this year, and uh, we will need some new staff on our team here. Uh, so please pray for, for new um, staff to be convicted of, of what there is to do in, in Wellington mm. and join the team. Um, but also in the office, we've got quite a lot of, um, of vacancies and we are quite stretched. So please mm. pray that God would provide there. Yeah, that's important. Thanks. That's great. Hey, thanks so much. It's really cool to hear about uh, what you're up to and everything God's doing through TSCF. And, you know, for, uh, for us at the street, missions is such an important part of, of who we are and what we do. And uh, once a month, there is a, a missions prayer night uh, that uh, a bunch of people gather over Zoom just to pray for our missionaries like Caitlin and others around the world. The next one is coming up on uh, Monday, the 25th of July, um, 7.30 till 8.30. And if you want the Zoom link for that, you can email missions at the street.org. Dot NZ. Um, Caitlin, I'd love to pray for you and okay. TSCF and pray for us as we uh, stop talking and uh, transition into, into worship. Uh, so important what we do, we, we, we gather as a service to, to, to worship our living God. So uh, I'll pray and then hand over to the team. Yeah. Oh, Father, thank you so much for, uh, for what we've just heard, Lord, hearing uh, how you are moving uh, through organisations like TSCF on campus and hearing those stories of lives changed. Lord, we worship you and praise you for, uh, for the work that um, you graciously allow us to partner with. Lord, I thank you for Caitlin. I thank you for 
uh, her heart to serve you, Lord, and, and serve the students of New Zealand. And Lord, of these uh, requests that she has brought up, Father, we, we hand them to you and say, Lord, please make a way. Lord, where there are staffing needs, where there's volunteer needs, Lord, we ask that you, you fill those. Uh, Lord, with the right people, Lord, uh, to release TSCF and, and their partners to, to continue to reach people uh, across this country. Lord, we pray for our students, Lord, for those who are really battling. Lord, I pray that um, you would minister to them, Lord, through Christians on campus, that they would find uh, a friendly face and a warm spirit, Lord, uh, someone who, who can come alongside them and encourage them. And also I pray that you would bless that ministry, uh, bless Caitlin and all that she's doing with it too. Father, now as we uh, turn to worship, Lord, as we're about to, to sing, Lord Father, I pray that uh, the words of our mouth, Lord, as David said, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We give you this time. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Pray for Jenny as she um, talks to us from God's Word today. God, I pray that you just speak so powerfully through Jenny, um, that your words um, become her words, and 
that your message of who you are and the truth of who you are and what you are telling us just comes through super clearly as well, God. So yeah, we lift Ginny up as she talks to us today. Amen. My husband, Simon, and I have three daughters, Gracie, Jess, and Izzy. And today I want to introduce you to Izzy. She is 11, and as you can see, she is an absolute character. Now, the rule in our house is when the girls get home from school, they have to make their lunches before they can do anything else ready for the next day. So they're not allowed screens until they've made their lunch boxes. Now, Gracie and Jess are pretty good at getting on with it and um, sorting themselves out. But often with Izzy, I've, I'll come in to see how she's getting on and she's in the garden looking for caterpillars. And I'll say, Izzy, have you finished making your lunch? And she'll say, oh no, sorry. Um, so back into the kitchen, she'll carry on making her lunch. Maybe I'll make a cup of tea and go and sit down. I turn around and she's gone again. And this time she's in the bathroom practicing putting high ponytails in her hair. Or whatever it is, but you get the picture. The, if you came in part way through her making her lunch for the next day, I think you'd find it very difficult to guess what she was meant to be doing. And it made me wonder, if you could watch my life like a movie, that's a scary thought, isn't it? Even if you could watch the last week of my life on this screen right now, and you had to guess, what is the thing that Jenny has been tasked to do? I wonder what you would guess. And I asked the same question about you. If we could play your life on this screen right now, and we had to guess, based on what we had seen, what is the mission you have been given? I wonder what we would say. The truth is, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have been given a mission. And surely, if we're engaging well with the mission we've been given, our lives should bear the evidence, right? Well, I just want to read us the mission just to remind us what it is. It's found in um, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, and it says this. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Imagine being in the disciples' shoes. It's like the most significant handover meeting ever, right? Jesus says, OK, guys, your training is complete. Now go. He commissioned them. And this is what they had been watching him do. They'd been walking with him, learning from him. And now it was down to them. He gave them a clear mission. And as soon as a person becomes a disciple or a follower of Jesus, yet they join the mission. If you are a Christian today, this is your mission now, I know some of you watching this today would not call yourselves a Christian or a follower of Jesus. And I'm so glad you're here. I love that you are listening to these messages, exploring who Jesus is. But the reason I'm talking about this today is I really believe that what the Bible says about Jesus is true. I believe that God created you and I, that he loves you beyond what you could ever comprehend. But we as people, as humankind, have rejected him. We think that we know the best way to live our lives. We want to be in charge and in control. And the Bible calls that sin. But God loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die as a punishment for the sin of every person who has ever and will ever live. So that if you believe in him and accept that, that you're forgiven and adopted into God's family. You see, sin separates us from God, but believing in Jesus unites us with God forever. And that's why this series, this message today is important. Even if you're skeptical about Jesus, just imagine if this really is true, isn't that the kind of news that everyone should have the opportunity to hear and to respond to? And so that's why we're taking these three weeks to talk about the mission, because it matters. 
So let's just think back to the mission that we've been given that I just read. This section in Matthew is called the Great Commission. Now, a commission is a formal sending. If you commission someone, you formally send them to do something. And I imagine in this moment, Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible, you know, it always says to him, your mission, should you choose to accept it? But I think for so many of us, we've misunderstood. It clearly is a commission, but I think if we're honest, our lives demonstrate that we've interpreted it as permission. We treat the great commission like the great permission. You can go and make disciples of all nations if you want, or if it fits in with the busyness of your life, or if you have the gift of evangelism, or in the moments when you're all inspired because you've just listened to a message on outreach, or you've read a great book. But the truth is, this is what we have been commissioned to do. And God, in his graciousness, is reminding us again, this is your mission, should you choose to accept it. So where do we start? Well, just like the disciples who walked and talked with Jesus actually followed him, i.e. they copied what he did. Isn't that what we're also meant to do as followers of Jesus? The word Christian comes from the Greek word Christianos, which means follower of Jesus. It's not admirers of Jesus. It's not even believers in Jesus, but followers of him. People whose goal is to become like him. Now, the reason I say all of that is because it's like sometimes we separate this mission that we've just been talking about from the rest of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We treat the mission to reach people, outreach, as we often call it, like this optional extra to our following of Jesus. But if we actually live to become like Jesus by copying what he did, outreach will be an integral part of our lives. I challenge you to take a chapter of one of the Gospels and try and copy what Jesus did. I'm certain it would include talking to people about God about his kingdom. It would include praying for people. It would include stopping to show kindness to people because Jesus loved people and he acted in line with that at all times, whoever they were. And so if we live to become like Jesus, outreach will be natural and integral to our lives. I want us each to consider today what it would take for the movie of my life, for the movie of your life, to show that I'm actually on this mission that Jesus has given us. So let's look at how Jesus did it. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. And so I'm going to read that now. It says this, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now we're going to be looking at these verses over the next three weeks. And today we're really going to focus in on verse 35. And verse 35 says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues. When dinner's ready in our house, often the conversation will go something like this. Um, I'll say to one of the girls, can you please go and tell dad that dinner's ready? And whichever child it happens to be will react or will respond with, I wonder if any of you recognize that scenario. I wonder though, to what extent we can all be a bit like that with our mission, outreach, telling people about Jesus. We go to church on a Sunday and we play our part in having great services. And if we're really trying to reach people, we make sure our services are welcoming for people who are new to church or exploring faith. We, um, we explain things, we explain words, we explain concepts. We try and make people feel at home as possible. 
We give people an idea of the next steps we'd love them to take. We make people feel welcome because we genuinely want any person, whatever their beliefs, to experience our church as a safe place to belong and to explore who Jesus is. We sing our hearts out. We preach about Jesus. Then we go to life groups each week and we sit with other Jesus followers and we talk about Jesus and we talk about the Bible and we encourage each other. And all of those things are really important, by the way. I'm not saying that we should stop doing any one of them. But if the only times we're sharing stories of faith and talking about Jesus are when we're with other Christians, it struck me that it's a bit like one of my daughters yelling from her seat in the lounge. If dad's close enough to hear, then he'll get the message. But she's not really too bothered about whether he actually hears. You know, she's delivered the message and she feels like her responsibility has been discharged. You know, this verse today tells us that Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues. He didn't expect people to come to him. He went to them. And I did a bit of reading in preparation about the first century synagogues and they were likely used like Jewish community centers. So Jesus was making sure that he spent time in the places and spaces that people who did not yet believe in him were. In fact, before Jesus had even started his ministry, hadn't he already gone to where people are in the most profound way? Jesus, the son of God, stepped out of heaven. He took on flesh. He became a baby, a human in order to come to where we are. You know, Jesus has demonstrated this to the fullest extent, and that's the title of today's message, that we're to go where people are, because that's what Jesus did. So are you spending time near people who don't yet believe in him? Are you investing in friendships with people who are not yet followers of Jesus? You know, I, I must admit, I find this challenging being a pastor. Um, most of the people I know are Christians, and so I have to get a little bit creative. I've spent the last three years serving on my school board as a way of getting to know people who are not in the church. I've coached netball for my girls at school. I'm intentional about talking to people in the playground at school pickup. Kevin Harney, who wrote um, the Organic Outreach books, he once gave a great tip that I've hung on to. He suggested looking through your calendar in the morning and working out when you're going to see people who don't know Jesus during the day. And to, as you plan your day in the morning to pray for God appointments, to pray for opportunities to get to know someone or to bless someone or maybe to get to share your faith with someone. But this isn't only for us as individuals to consider, but also for, for our church, right? Do we expect people to come to us or do we go to where people are? You know, many of you will know we launched East over four years ago now to be missional. It was 100% our heart to have a location of the street in the eastern suburbs to be where people are. And yet we spent the first two years gathering on Sundays, expecting people to come to us. And then after a couple of years, an opportunity came up for us to run a dinner from the community centre. It was free food and a friendly, safe space to meet people, to make friends and to eat together. We call it community dinner. As a church, we finally went to where people are, or some people at least, to meet a need that we knew for sure was a real need. And our desire is that this would lead to other opportunities to meet real needs and take the community of the church to where people are. This is a photo of community dinner pre-COVID. The crowd that come every Wednesday now are a smaller crowd and the team is a smaller team, but we keep showing up so that the people of our community can experience for themselves what it's like to be embraced and loved and cared for by the church. Jesus went where people were. So I wonder today, in what new ways can you go to where people are? I wanna give us somewhere practical to start today. I've been reading a book called Surprise the World by Michael Frost. 
Um, I'd encourage you, write that title down, look it up. It's only a short book. It won't take you long to read. It's a book about living as highly missional people. But whether you read it or not, there's a couple of ideas in there that would be a great place to start that are really um, relevant to what we're talking about today. He uses an acrostic in the book that is bells. So every letter of bells stands for something different. But the first two are particularly relevant to what we're talking about. So I'm just going to talk to us about the first two of those today. The first one in bells is B for bless. And so the instruction is bless three people this week, at least one of whom is not yet a Christian. You know, we're called to bless just for the sake of being a blessing, right? Loving others, um, putting them before ourselves. This is not an ulterior motive. Um, we're not only blessing someone so that we can share our faith with them, so that we can tell them about Jesus. The key to blessing someone is that the recipient feels blessed, right? <laughs> if the recipient doesn't feel blessed, it's not a blessing. So that's something to bear in mind. But it could be um, words of affirmation. It could be an act of kindness. It could be a gift. But what would it take to bless three people this week, one of whom is not a Christian? So that's B, bless. The second one um, is E, eat. Eat with three people this week, at least one of whom is not a Christian. There's a great quote in the book. Um, it says, the table is the great equaliser in relationships. When we eat together, we discover the inherent humanity of all people. We share stories and hopes and fears and disappointments. People open up to each other. And we ourselves can open up and share the same things, including our faith in Jesus. I don't know if this has been your experience, but it's been ours. Gathering around food is a powerful way to develop relationship. And so the challenge here is to eat with three people this week, at least one of whom is not a Christian. And that doesn't mean invite three different people around for a fancy three course meal. It could just be a coffee and a snack in a cafe. But um, it's challenging, isn't it, to think about doing these things. You know, as I've been preparing this message, I've found myself imagining how much more the movie of my life would look if I'm actually taking the mission, would, sorry, would look like I'm actually taking the mission seriously if I just did these two things that I've just talked about, if I blessed three people a week and I ate with three people a week. And I, so I want to challenge you today to do this for the next month and see what happens. What might God do if we took this on board? Now, if you're anything like me, the first thought that you would have just thought is, whoa, Jenny, I'm far too busy to do that. I can relate. What I realise, though, is that is the problem, isn't it? Like we talked about at the start, we've misinterpreted this commission, this mission we've been given as permission. And we think it's OK to prioritise other things over the mission that God has given us. But I don't think it is OK. If this is the mission that we're on, isn't this the most important thing that we could be doing? So instead of walking away from this message saying, I'm too busy, how about we go away and consider what would it take for me to actually do this? Why not plan it right now? Who are the three people you'll bless this week? At least one of them, someone who isn't yet a Christian. Who are the three people you'll eat with this week? Even if it's just a coffee and a snack. At least one of them who isn't yet a Christian. And if you're watching this today and you're not a Christian, I wonder if there's a Christian that you know that you could um, reach out to this week and spend some time talking to them, asking them why they believe what they believe. If Jesus went where people who didn't yet know him were, we need to go where people are. This is the mission after all. Let me pray for us. Father, we want to just start by saying sorry if we have not taken the mission that you've given to us seriously. We're so grateful for Jesus. We're so grateful for 
what you did for us and we, we want to join in on this mission that you've called us to. Lord, I pray for every one of us today that um, you would challenge and inspire and do something in our hearts, God, that would mean we couldn't walk away from here the same. Lord, I pray for every one of us that the, the movie of our life would look a little bit more like the mission that you've called us to this week. So we commit ourselves to you. We love you, Lord. We genuinely believe this is the best news anyone could ever know. And so we commit ourselves now to sharing that with the people in our lives. We love you, Lord. Fill us, be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what a powerful message. What mm. a challenge that uh, Jenny laid down mm. just there. What's mm. your takeaways, Jeremy? Yeah, I mean, what a great way to, to open our, our three-week series. Mm. And I loved just that little statement, you know, whether... Uh, Jesus sent us out on the great commission, mm. but often we can treat that as the great permission. And just the way that Jenny teased that out, you know, that sense that we sometimes think that, oh, I'll, I'll share my faith when I feel like it, mm. or if I have time, or maybe when I'm feeling particularly inspired, where it's like, no, nah, it's not the case. Like, we are a sent people. Yeah. Like, God Himself has commissioned us to go. Like we we have more than permission, you know. Mm. It's um, yeah. I loved how she brought that out. Yeah. 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 What wow. about you? Yeah. Um. I just was thinking about those um those three things, the three three people that I could bless this week, sure. or yeah. the three people I could uh, eat with, who I could share at the table with. Um, who are those people that I can do that with on a weekly basis? Mm. Um, and how can I be building relationship with people mm. as I as I do that. Um, as she said, the, the table is a great equaliser and mm. so true, isn't it? Mm. Um, and I was also struck by uh, when Jenny said, Jesus is the son of God, stepped out of heaven in order to come to where we are. And that is just such a powerful reminder of mm. why we're here. And mm. uh, like you said, that it's not, it's not just something, sharing our faith is not just something that we do. Uh, when we feel like it, but yeah. um, that's why Jesus came, and that's um, that's what living our faith out, out mm. is. Mm. Um, and just as we think about Jesus as the Son of God stepping out of uh, heaven and coming to meet us where we are, uh, so it's a great um, opportunity each week that we get to share communion as yeah. well. And um, and that comes partly out of what Jesus would do. He would sit and he would eat with his friends. Um, and I was thinking of that and thinking about the Last Supper uh, this, uh, this week and um, looking at Jesus' words in Luke um, when he was sharing at the table with, with his friends and even with those who were going to betray him. Um, it says, he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And when Jesus was sharing at the table, he was also um, leading, leading those with him to know something of, of who he is and what he was here to do, that he yeah. would die on the cross um, so that they and we might have life in mm. him. And so as you, um, as you share communion now, uh, maybe that's something you want to reflect on. Um, Jesus' death uh, on the cross, Jesus' body and his blood shed for you so that you might have life. Mm. Um, so I'll pray and then if you, um, you'll have a bit of time to, to take communion together. Mm. Lord, we thank you so much for, for Jesus. Mm. We thank you that um, you didn't leave us uh, to, to work things out on our own, but uh, for that reminder that Jesus stepped out of heaven to come and meet us where we are. Thank you so much that you've saved us and that we can have life in you. And as we share um, in communion now, would you uh, remind us afresh of the hope that we have in Jesus um, as, we, as we come to you at the table. In Jesus' name, amen.
song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Holy, there is no one.
be fitting to, to have a, a service and a message so focused on the gospel and outreach and proclaiming the importance of sharing the good news of Jesus without giving you an opportunity to respond. And I don't know where you're watching this from today. I don't know if you're a follower of Jesus or not, but for a moment, I want to appeal directly to you if you are engaging with this service today and you've listened to those beautiful songs and you've 
watched, uh, listened to Caitlin share the communion message. You've listened to Jenny talk about this gospel, this message that Jesus has asked his followers to go and share. And you're listening going, I don't know him. It sounds like great stuff, but, but I don't know him. And maybe there's been a tug at your heart today. Um, and you think you need to respond. And this, that last song we sang about this beautiful name of Jesus comes from uh, Acts chapter 4, where it talks about some of the early, this book talks about some of the early acts, the actions of the first disciples. And uh, a guy called Stephen is preaching to people and he says to them, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name like the beautiful name of Jesus because that name means salvation. That name means salvation. The, Jesus came, lived a perfect life. He, he, he lived the life that we couldn't live and, and then went to the cross in the place where I deserve to go for my sin, where you deserve to go for your sin because everything we've done, that is every sinful thing is an offence against a holy God. But Jesus came to bridge that gap, to take my punishment, to take your punishment and make a way for us to be in relationship with God. He did it all himself. And he says, you can have this life, you can have this freedom, this forgiveness, this lifting of shame, this lifting of guilt, this new life, if you bow the knee to Jesus. And so I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. And, and if this is something that, that you have felt on your heart to do, then then you can borrow these words. There's no magic in the words. It's just an expression of your heart, your longing to know him. So you can repeat these words after me. God in heaven, I acknowledge today that, that I'm a sinner, that I have said things, I have thought things, I have done things that aren't right, that aren't good. That, that are wrong and, and I know that they are an offence against you, a holy God. God, I can't save myself. I can't do enough good things. I can't give away enough money. I am beyond saving myself and so, God, I submit and I say I'm sorry for the sins that I've committed and I ask you, Father, to forgive me God, forgive me for my sin. I ask for your mercy. I look at Jesus on the cross and I accept his sacrifice for me. I turn now from my sinful ways and I want to follow you. Please help me to follow you. I love you. Thank you that you love me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If that's a prayer that you've prayed, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. If that's a prayer that you've prayed, I want to say, well done and, and welcome to the family. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Please email us online at thestreet.org.nz. We'd just love to connect with you and encourage you in your Christian walk. Mm, great. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, well, it's been wonderful to be with you today. Yeah. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, we hope you have a really great week, whatever you're up to, and uh, that we see you again. See you soon. Kakite. Have a great week.